So if we take 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. How big is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught? Okay, let's be a little bit more. 9 times. Good. Times by, let's go, mu naught over 4 pi. What's mu naught over 4 pi? 10 to the minus 7. That is 900. Okay. So, and it's also equal to mu naught over epsilon naught times by 1 over 16 pi squared. Okay. So, you can check that mu naught over epsilon naught is equal to 16 pi squared times by 900. And I plugged some numbers in. And what I get for the square root of epsilon naught over mu naught is this is 1 over 377 e dot e. And uh, what I would like you guys to check is what are the units of this number? So what is th that 377? Is it a meter? Is it a coulomb? Is it an amp? So I want you guys to check right now what are the units of this number. S okay, do, do, do you understand the question, Al-Zahara? Yeah. Good. Okay, guys, so let's uh, maybe take a look at this together and uh, see. So on this side, we've got a power per unit area. Does everybody agree that power is equal to current times voltage? So if I want the dimensions of power per unit area, I can think about current times voltage. That'll be the dimensions of power over length squared. Okay, so that thing has to have the same dimensions as 1 over 137 times by the dimensions of E dot E. What is the dimensions of the electric field in terms of the dimensions of voltage? So V is like an integral of E dot dr. So the dimensions of volt over L is equal to the dimensions of E. Does everyone agree? So this is 1 over 137 volt squared over length squared. Everyone agree? Now, sorry? Oh, 377, good. Now, oh, okay. That was a test. William, you are getting good at this. This one over L squared and that one over L squared will cancel. Here we've got a V squared, there we've got a V. So that will cancel. So the dimensions of this number is actually the dimensions of V over I. Because there's a V left, there's an I. What does voltage divided by current? 
resistance. So this is 1 over 377 ohms. Okay. I thought I would show you because you might have been a bit shocked if I just wrote ohms there. But that is an ohm. Okay. Now, let's use this to check. But now you guys should be um, uptight and worried. Who was correct? Was it Tukong? Was it Husam? Was it Muzi? Who was closest to the value of V? Let's check. So the first thing that we need to estimate is the power per unit area. So let's study a 100 watt bulb and we will sit one meter away from that 100 watt bulb. So sit one meter away from the 100 watt bulb. So what will happen is the light comes out and it's spread over the surface of a sphere of a radius 1. So what will the surface area of a sphere with radius 1 be? 4 pi times 1 squared. So here's our bulb. There's the surface. This is a radius of 1 meter. That area is equal to 4 pi times by 1 squared. The power is 100 watts. So you can read that off the bulb. So the power per unit area is 100 over 4 pi. Just the power divided by the area. And this should be equal to E dot E. So let's say the mod of E squared divided by 377. So the mod of E will be equal to 377 times 100 over 4 pi square rooted. And I checked what is that equal to. This comes out at about 60 volts per meter. So there's a winner. Good. So roughly volts per meter. Okay. That would be the strength of the electric field. Good. Um, you know, we could calculate a few other things with light, uh, but I think that we'll stop now with light, and uh, we will start to talk about some relativity. Then we'll talk a bit about relativity, and then uh, either in the lecture later today, or else in the last little bit tomorrow, we will talk a little bit about gauge theory. Okay? So we're, we're trying to get towards gauge theory. Good. Okay. So let's now start to talk about relativity. So there's a basic idea here that we are exploring, and it's really symmetry. We want to know about the symmetries of the laws of physics. Okay? So that's the basic idea, symmetry. And uh, let me explain to you where that idea comes from, how it's used. Um, I will give it to you in the way that Galileo thought about it. He was the first one to think deeply about this. 
So now we'll talk about relativity. And uh, the basic idea, the most important concept is symmetries. Now, when we were discussing symmetries before, we said, imagine this is an infinitely long rod, and I rotate it. If you guys close your eyes, and I rotate this, and then you open your eyes, you cannot tell that I've rotated it. That's what I mean by a symmetry. Okay? I will perform some transformation, and there's nothing that you could measure to tell what transformation I did, how far I rotated it. So that was the idea of symmetry that we saw previously. The idea that we're going to have now is very similar. So we'll imagine the following. Here, so the holiday for you guys is less than 48 hours away. So it's already time for us to start thinking about the beach. <laughs> so this is going to be the beach. Okay. Then, next to the beach, what do you have? The sea. The sea. Good. So you guys haven't forgotten that yet. You've been working so hard, you just haven't seen it, but you still remember the sea is next to the beach. The sea is blue. There is the sea. And if you're lucky and you look out at the sea, you might see a ship. There is a ship on the sea. And the ship is sailing away. It's moving with some velocity v. The question is, if you study the laws of physics on the beach, so on the beach, you study what the laws of physics are, okay, or you are inside the ship and you cannot see outside and you study what the laws of physics are, will laws of physics be the same? And the way that Galileo phrased this is, he said, let's study some flies that are in the ship. By studying the flies, would you be able to tell how fast the ship is going? Okay? Equivalently, we could imagine being inside the ship, so imagine the windows are blocked, we don't know how fast we're going, the ship is just moving along, we start to drop balls, we watch things accelerating down a slope, we do all those kinds of experiments, and we ask ourselves, are these experiments exactly the same as they were? Do they give the same answers as when we did them on the beach at Musenberg? Or do the experiments give us slightly different answers? And the question you might ask yourself is, if the experiments do start to give you different answers, then perhaps you can tell how fast the ship is going by studying the answers from those experiments. And the assumption that Galileo made, and this is the relativity principle, is that any experiment that you do in the ship Moving with this speed, with this velocity v, you will get exactly the same answer as if you do that experiment on the beach. So that is a symmetry. The laws of physics don't change for the ship, even though it's moving with some velocity v. Okay? That's the basic idea of symmetry. Have you guys got the idea of what the symmetry is here? You can do physics in a lab that's moving with some velocity v and the physics will be exactly the same as the physics in a lab that's not moving. Okay? We want our equations to have that symmetry. So it was Galileo who first thought about these ideas and he was convinced that the physics in these two situations should be the same on the beach and in the ship moving with a constant velocity. As long as these two are moving relative to each other, 
with a constant velocity, we say that they are both inertial frames. If this ship was accelerating with some acceleration A, the physics in the ship would not be the same as the physics on the beach. So it's not just any movement. What's important here is that this velocity is a constant. So uh, the ship is moving with a constant velocity. And then the relativity principle, and, and this principle we believe is true, says um, the laws of physics on the beach are the same as the laws of physics on the ship. Those laws of physics are exactly the same. Good. Let's write down a few things, okay? Um, I want to describe the position of the ship. So the position of the ship, let's say that this is our origin on the beach. That's the, we'll take that to be the position of the ship. So the position of the ship is that unit vector, x ship. Now, you might want to know where is the position of the fly. And now there's two possibilities. You might measure the position of the fly like this, x fly. Or you might decide to measure the position of the fly when you are sitting on the ship. And if you're sitting on the ship, there is the position. Uh, let's use a different coordinate. Let's maybe say y fly. Okay? There's the position of the fly. Good. Can you guys tell me what is the relation between x fly and y fly. Good. Perfect. What is d by dt of x ship. Good. What is d2 x ship? Oh, but you don't know what I'm going to write now. <laughs> Very good. Zero. Good. Okay. Now, Um, that, okay, so the fact that the velocity of the ship is a constant also means, I mean, we can write that equation, the equations that we wrote in a slightly different way. Uh, we can also write um, x fly is equal to y fly plus, and we can write v t, okay? Because the velocity is a constant, okay? Good. Now, Newton knew what uh, Galileo had been thinking. He had read what Galileo had written. And he was very influenced by Galileo. And it was basically because of that that he formulated his laws the way that he did. He wanted to write down laws that would have the symmetry. Okay? So this is telling you if you have some coordinate on the ship, 
and some coordinate on the beach, how do you relate the two of them? Okay? So this relation between the two is called a Galilean transformation. This is how Galileo told you that you should relate the two sets of coordinates. And what Newton wanted to do, he wanted to write his equations in such a way that they would be the same on the ship or on the beach, which means they would really have the symmetry in them. And that was because Newton believed the relativity principle, the laws on the beach are the same as the laws on the ship, and he knew how to relate the coordinate on the beach to the coordinate in the ship. So he wanted this to be a symmetry of his equations. So for that reason, he wrote his equations in the following form. He said, the mass of the fly, and let's imagine there's more than one fly, they all have the same mass. So we can maybe have x fly 1, x fly 2, and so on. So there's a bunch of flies. What Newton said is, the mass times the acceleration of the ith fly, dt2, so that's the mass times the acceleration, must be a sum of forces, j, so all of the other flies exert a force on the ith fly, And this force, Newton said, depends only on the distance or the vector between the two flies. So that's what Newton wrote down for his second law. And why did he do this? Well, for the following reason. Let's look at this side of the equation first of all. Okay. So if we want d2, dt2, x fly, for the i fly, this will be equal to d2, dt2. We need the coordinate on the ship for the i fly, and we need the t. But that second derivative there gives us zero. So we land up with d2 yi fly dt2. So you immediately learn that this side of the equation, if you just rewrite it, this is equal to mass of the fly times by d2 yi of the fly dt2. So that's what you've got for this side of the equation. Now, we'll have a sum. We'll have j is not equal to i. And we now want to express that in terms of coordinates in the ship. So let's take a look at how we do that. So the position of the i fly on the beach minus the position of the j fly on the beach will be equal to. We know the position on the beach will be position on the ship plus the t minus position of the j fly on the ship plus vt, and you see vt minus vt, that term will cancel against that term. And you land up getting yi fly minus yj fly. So what sits in here is the difference of the positions of the fly on the ship. minus yj fly. Mm -hmm. 
So if you take a look, Newton's law on the beach and Newton's law on the ship are exactly the same. This Galilean transformation, so this is called the Galilean transformation, is a symmetry of Newton's laws. If you study particles in classical mechanics on the beach and you try to work out what are the laws governing those particles, or you study it on the ship, you will get the same set of laws, so you will learn nothing about how fast the ship is moving. And that's exactly what the relativity principle is saying. The laws of physics in any reference frame that's inertial are the same. Okay? Good. Any questions on, on that idea of how we taking how symmetries are playing a role and what the symmetry is? Okay, good. Okay, guys, I think it's time for a 10-minute break. Let's stretch our legs.